My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. And hello, thank you for joining me for another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Paul Glover. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Paul? You are, David. Thank you. Paul is, he says, the no BS workforce performance coach, a quote unquote recovering trial lawyer, an ex felon, an unabashed Starbucks addict, a Chicago Bears fanatic, okay, the author of Work Quake, a speaker on business and leadership topics, and a member of the Forbes Co Coaching Council. Thank you for taking some time to talk with us today, Paul. David, first, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and your audience. It's a privilege. I appreciate it. Let's get started with your background. You're a pretty interesting dude here. Take it in chronological order if you want or whatever order you want. I've got to know about the background. Um, I, I want to know about other things, but I got to know how did you bounce around from being the trial attorney to the ex felon, even if that may be difficult to talk about. The Starbucks addiction, I can understand. We all need caffeine. The Bears fanatic, I'll let that slide for now. Um, but I want to get into some of your background so what you say can be taken in the proper context. Absolutely. And uh, first, I've gotten, believe me, I've gotten over the embarrassment of my past. Uh, I created it. Uh, I don't believe in hiding scars. I actually think that they make us who we are. Uh, they, and absolutely. I, came to the conclusion early on that I was going to emb embrace adversity because I think that it, it, uh, it's a part of who you are. Like I said, I, I don't understand people who run away from the bad parts of life. Uh, I think they are a part of life. And if you can't learn from that adversity or terrible experience that you have, uh, it does not, uh, does not give you the momentum you need to move forward because we're all going to experience it. So to answer your question about, about how uh, I became a, a, a ex felon, uh, first I was a lawyer and I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, practicing the law, but, uh, I'm a flawed individual and uh, I have a tendency at that time uh, towards self-destructive behavior. And uh, one of the things was I, I because of, I practiced labor and employment law, uh, I associated with uh, some guys who uh, were union guys and uh, I decided I wanted to be like them. I was a bad guy wannabe. Hmm. And uh, I will tell everyone that uh, that most of our misfortune comes from two uh, two places. One, it comes from ourself. Uh, I I use a quote that uh, that uh, Mooney uh, gives us, and that is that I am the uh, the hardest person I've ever had to deal with. And the second thing is who we associate with. Uh, as much as we would like to think we can associate with toxic individuals and it not rub off on us and make us worse, make, make us like them, we're absolutely wrong. And I did both those things. I was a bad guy wannabe and uh, I behaved accordingly. And because I was a trustee on a, a union health and welfare and a union pension fund, uh, myself and the, uh, the real bad guys, uh, made some investments that benefited us personally. Mm. Not that it hurt the funds, but we still got kickbacks from those arrangements. Yeah. And, uh, after a period of time, uh, investigations, uh, were started and ended up with me being charged with 22 counts and a, uh, by a federal grand jury. 
And after two trials, uh, I went to prison for seven years. Uh, I have to admit that I would not recommend going to prison as a opportunity for self-reflection, but prison saved my life. And uh, I recognized that not at the time, of course, I spent the first two years of my prison sentence uh, planning revenge. How I was going to get even for all of those people that put me in prison. And it, it took two years of incarceration mm me to start the self-reflection process that led me to the inevitable conclusion that I put myself in prison. Now, what was it during those two years that allowed you to be reflective? Because, I mean, let's be real, you could have kept going. There Was there a motivation to change or you know, there are people in prison who don't change. There are people who are in there for 30, 40 years, and you could go visit them and they're the same they, as they were 20 years ago. Well, what what else was it than, you know, other than here I am within these walls, you know? Well, it, 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 and I would take that to my family. Uh, it is so easy, especially with seven years of incarceration, when you're looking at that amount of time, you know, it, it's long. And obviously the impact, the negative impact of my behavior and the results rippled out and in, impacted my entire family, my wife and my two sons. And most people, most prisoners uh, are not going to be able to maintain their uh, familial relationships for that, experience, that, that length of time. Uh, people just drift away. They decide they don't want to. They don't want to be associated with you anymore. That the pain and grief you've caused them because of your actions make them finally decide that it's not worth the wait, and uh, and they go away. Well, my wife and my sons didn't. And after two years of having my wife and sons visit me once a month, and drive drive for five hours to a federal prison camp. Uh, stay in a crappy hotel or motel, uh, visit me for uh, two days and then drive back. Uh, that support, but also that engagement, that interaction led me to believe that I had to be a better person, that, that I, 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 they did not deserve for me not to recognize uh, my flaws and also the fact that I am prone to, uh, to self-sabotage and that I had to become a better person for them. So that was the motivation. And, and I believe that that's where most of us need to get our motivation. We need to get it from others. Trying to do it ourselves, it, it doesn't last that long. The situation doesn't permit it to be that powerful. But if you've got a reason to be motivated, uh, then you will do what's necessary to, uh, to satisfy that motivation. And that's what I did. At some point after two years, I, I said, for me to for me to survive this experience and for my family to survive it, I have to understand why I am the way I am and take the steps necessary to change. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's so true. I mean, when you know anybody in sales or marketing would talk about the pain point and how you can't work with a business owner and help them or even try to help them unless you can somehow get through their defenses and get them to own their failure as much as their success and kind of touch on their these pain points and it doesn't matter what your rates are what you can or can't do you can't work with them unless they've been through some pain i mean one of my best clients was uh, a, a business owner and she came to me i spoke to her group her her uh, professional organization and i remember three uh, it was either two or three years later she finally called me up and i said who's this i didn't remember because it had been years and she just said i'm tired of people making fun of me because my website looks like you know crap on a stick basically it's a joke it doesn't look professional but all my larger competitors have one that works it looks professional and i don't and i've tried to do it myself a hundred times i can't do it i don't have the time then she was finally ready you know 
Well, and you know, it's interesting you say that because that's how I look at coaching clients. Uh, the, the hardest person to coach is someone who's successful. They, they don't see the need to change. But as I yeah. tell each one of them, when we start our conversation, you've reached out to me because there's something about who you are or what you're doing that is bothering you or you wouldn't have made the call. So let's explore what that is. And that always takes the, takes the same course. And that is that for me to try to tell someone new to my coaching program what their issues are is ridiculous. And for them to tell me what their issues are is ridiculous. What I need to hear from is their team. The people that report to them know what those issues are and they know the blind spots. And I connect those two things. I think the blind spots and self-sabotage go together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. You're, yeah. You're preaching to the choir here. And I, I want to ask you about that. I remember years ago, a few years ago, there was a marketing agency that contacted me and they said, um, all, we've got clients that are leaving us in droves. We can't figure it out how or why and we just can't get a grip on this new marketing thing and i just thought well that's why they're leaving you in troves from your perspective as a coach with your life experience and your professional experience too because there's probably more life experience and professional experience than we touched on so far how do you get them to see this in a way that's real you know it's like when you train animals they tell you you have to take the animal and make it you know where i'm what i'm gonna where i'm going with this huh sure. you have to make the animal smell its own excrement so that it knows this is where i go to the bathroom otherwise they're just going to mark their territory everywhere so you have to train them and for human infants it's similar in a way they have to be potty trained or they go all over the place. How, how do you get them to smell that for lack of a better uh, metaphor? Well, it, it does go to the, the people that they that they consider be their team. Usually it's the executive team. And I go to that through the process of the 360 degree review because that gives me the information to now go back and have a serious conversation with the leader about those blind spots, about what they're doing that is, is hurting the organization and themselves. Uh, it, it's obviously it has to be anonymous because as much as we preach psychological safety, I don't see too many people that have the guts to speak truth to power. It's a lovely concept. But when you're when your meal, your next meal and your car payment and your kids college is dependent upon your job, you're not prone to do that. However, given the opportunity to talk to that impartial third party who promises anonymity, it's amazing how much information people will give you. Uh, with that information, right. I'm able to then go back and say, this is not me talking because the thing they say is you don't know me. And you want to tell me I've got a problem. No, I now have talked to the people who do know you. And by the way, I frame it in the context of this is feedback and you need to always consider feedback a gift. If you want someone to tell you the truth, that's a gift. And so when they do, you must appreciate it. Instead of being upset by it, appreciate it and embrace it. Or attack them. Oh, we absolutely. Uh, the the knee jerk reaction when someone tells you you're wrong is, as a manager, is a knee jerk reaction that expresses to this person how upset you are with that information. And guess what? The first time you do that will be the last time they tell you the truth. Why would they want to go through that relationship issue, knowing what the outcome has already been, people learn very quickly about what they can say and what they should not say. So with the information I've collected through the 360, I now go back and we have the conversation. And normally we start with a single topic because the 360 covers all levels of behavior. We're not ready to attack the entire
entire human being here. We want to take one topic. And the easiest one to start with is communication. Because most leaders believe that they are fantastic communicators. And that's because they believe in telepathy. They believe that if they think it, everybody else should hear it. Mm -hmm. and, and the results of the 360 inevitably shows that their team sees them as terrible communicators, that they basically don't understand the message. Uh, they don't understand what's expected of them. There, there is a whole range of things that the leader is not being clear about that leaves people in uncertainty and doubt. By the way, if you leave people in uncertainty and doubt, they operate out of fear. Well, yeah, because they're constantly trying to figure out what does so-and-so want me to do so I don't get fired or get browbeaten. I've worked at agencies like that where nobody knew what what in the world was going on from, from one minute to the next because the person in charge had no idea what was going on and they didn't care. And this was usually at family owned and operated agencies because you knew that the, the, the person in charge knew that they were always going to get paid. They knew that they always had a steady paycheck no matter what. Even if the company was doing horribly, they would still get paid because dad owns the company or your mom owns the agency, whatever. So they could go and take four hour lunches or whatever. It doesn't matter. Those are, are they're rife with incompetence. Well, and first, you're absolutely, you're spot on. Most of my practice has been with family-owned companies, and they're probably more dysfunctional than anybody would ever believe, and still successful, which is amazing. But that's normally because of the people who are actually making sure that the company's successful. It doesn't necessarily go to ownership or leadership. Right, the, people, uh, the, the handful of people who are really busting their spleen yeah. to make sure that the machine keeps running. David, when, when, the, when the research shows us that 66 plus percent of employees are not engaged, yeah. it tells you something right there about leadership. But it also says, I've got a strong core of 30% that for whatever reason, usually self-motivated, uh, they are making this thing work. But what I do with that information, because with that information, I now am going to make a decision about whether or not the person who has contacted me is, it, is going to be in my program. Uh, first, I am an acquired taste. I tell everybody that up front. Uh, if you want me to be engaged as your coach, uh, it's going to be a rough ride. Because if you are serious about change, it requires that not only do we have an action plan, that, but that there be accountability. Now, let me ask you just as an aside. Sure. And, and I mean, this varies from person to person. I am a horrible coach, um, and I'm very op open about that. I don't even think I am a coach. Um, I, I, I tackle more just the marketing aspect and just say, tell you know, what are you trying to do? Let's work on that. How do you, from your perspective, work with the client to come up with an approach and i'm guessing that you have to have an organized deliberate plan first and then go down and develop specific strategies that stem from that but how do you get started with that well we take uh, and again what what happens is the information that i've gotten from the 360 gives us our starting point like i said i like to start off with communication and most leaders are shocked by the realization that their team doesn't believe they're good communicators so we have that discussion so let me tell you that at that point i'm making a decision based on your reaction the person who is now going to enter into the program to be coach your reaction is going to dictate what happens next let me give you the extreme example. I, uh, I had this identical conversation about a month and a half ago with a, a, a president owner of a $60 million operation. And he was so shocked by the results of the 360 that he said, I'm going to need a few days to, to process this. Okay, I get that. So he contacted me in a few days and he said, by the way, would you mind doing the 360 again? I said, well, my, my action plan is this. We start off with this 360, and at the end of our 12-month contract, we do it again. 
And the deal is my compensation is based on our reaching the goals that we set that show improvement from where we begin to that, that 12 month period. That, that way we have a measurable, we have to have, I have to have measurables. Uh, that Metrics. Working. Yeah, absolutely. And what I want, of course, is I want that 360 to now reflect that, that we've actually made progress. Uh, because once again, I base 50% of my compensation on outcome. So when I said that to him, he said, well, I really, I really want to do it again now. And I said, well, tell me why. And he said, well, I got my team together and I told them how disappointed I was with the outcome of the 360. And I told them that we were going to do it until we got it right. Needless to say, the conversation ended at that point with me saying, you are one dumb son of a bitch. Good and for you, because I, I mean, it, it's obvious that he, you're just going to keep auditing or, or repeating it, yeah. this until you come back with your 360 saying everything looks great you're an incredible genius I, i've never seen a, a biped like you before that's what he wants to hear and it is what he wants to hear and yeah by the way, there, there, there are people like that who oh i know who hear that and and they don't want to accept it well well guess what you don't need coaching not for me anyway uh, because again if we're going to do this together as a team, and that's the way I look at coaching, I believe it's a partnership. And that's why I put uh, my skin in the game. I put 50% of my compensation in the game. And at the end of that year, if you don't believe that we have evidence that shows that we achieve the goals that we set together, I don't get the money. And it's that simple. Uh, and so what that does, of course, is now the level of accountability goes up. Because in our every other week conversation, we're going to talk about the action plan that we put together and the action steps that are associated with that action plan. So it's saying, by the way, mm. for some people, this is just too methodical. Uh, and, and I had one guy at about three months in, he said, I just can't do this anymore. I said, well, why not? And he said, well, you really expect me to do these things. I was like, yeah. well, you're the one that said you wanted to do them. You're the one that said this is the action step you were going to take to do them. Why wouldn't I expect that of you? And he said, well, this is just too hard. I said, I'm sorry. We had the conversation about the fact that this requires a commitment of time and energy, and you need to, to respect that commitment. And if you're not willing to make it, you're not, you're, you're not the guy that should be in my coaching program. And so he bailed. Uh, by the way, the penalty for that is paying me for the whole year. Which I think is reasonable because you have to have that in your contract, as you well know, as a you know former trial attorney. I mean, you have to have that embedded in your contract or you're going to have people ghosting on you or f flaking out because they saw a commercial or some other, you know, crazy behavior. You know, some dog barked at him, so now they can't work anymore. I mean, you, you hear all kinds of uh, crazy stories. Let me ask you, in, in your view, what really is effective leadership today in a post-COVID-19 economy? Many people, you know, are still trying to figure out which end is up, which personally I don't understand. but what is effective leadership to you in especially in light of you know the current situations and everything well it it, it obviously has changed uh, and and i and as much as there, there are things about people's behavior today that may irritate me because again i'm a little more hardcore than most but but the reality is that that we are moving from a industrial mindset to an information mindset when it comes to leadership and that requires that we not need butts in the seats where we can see them do the work. We actually have to trust them to do the work. So for a leader now, by the way, most, most, most managers are exactly that. And they, they need to manage people to make force them to do the work. People don't want to be managed anymore. And they've had a taste of freedom. So they're not going to accept that. What they are looking for is a coach. Uh, a facilitator, a mediator, someone who provides them with the resources, the training, the development, so they can do their job. I believe that that's most people. By the way, that to me generates engagement. 
is that you give accountability to the person who's doing the work and you expect them to do the work. So when we start looking at leadership traits, uh, one of the big ones, and, and this comes as no surprise, is that you need empathy more than ever now because you need to understand the issues that the person who's actually doing the work is encountering so that you can establish reasonable expectations. One of my, one of my axioms is you can have expectations and expect them to be met until the situation changes. Because once the situation changes, the expectations have to change accordingly. We're not in charge of that anymore. The, 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 the pandemic took that out of our hands because before we thought we were in charge of this thing. And, and we were to a certain degree. Like I said, it was very much an industrial mindset about I'm going to pay you, but I'm paying you for your time. And I believe that that's something that we need to get over. We should be paying for outcomes. Uh, and, and that allows the person to get the work done and meet those acceptable expectations and standards, but not do it in such a rigid fashion. So to me, you've got to be flex much more flexible and have empathy that allows you to react to the situation and to the demands of the workforce and workplace. Uh, it's different now. And if you're not able to do that, you're not able to see that, then you're not going to be successful. And by the way, I look at the this, this thing they've termed as the great resignation to absolutely show by walking away how dissatisfied people are with the industrial age command and control management style. And, and because if your people are, are engaged, if they're engaged and committed, they don't leave, they stay. It's a, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, somebody who works online all day, you know, de developing websites, working with SEO, working with marketing collateral, you work more, most effectively from home when you have to get in a car and drive for an hour to get to an office, then get to your cubicle, deal with people smoking, you know, come to work drunk, whatever, fighting and everything in the office. Now you have to worry about, you know, getting ill, working in these cubicles and everything. Let people work remotely so they, they can do the job. I think the problem is that management doesn't know how to tell if you're delivering on what they need, that they, they don't want to have to look and see, did you do it? They're so accustomed to looking over your shoulder and saying, well, so-and-so is sitting in front of the computer, so he must be working. You're spot on with that. Uh, first, the, the, the research shows that at least 40% of all jobs being performed today in America could be done remotely. And this argument about we're not getting the social interaction that is necessary for a team, I just find that to be bogus. I'm sorry. I don't accept that. Uh, I believe that there is something to be said for social interaction, but the reality is most of that in the office place is a distraction. Yeah, it is. It is. Because honestly, all, you know, if I look back on all the years that I've spent working, okay, and I mean, I'm not a spring chicken how it has to have been several years all combined of all of the times that i've seen sexual harassment in the workplace which is just really really bothersome when you you know when you have co-workers coming up to you in tears because some supervisor won't leave them alone or you have people with drinking problems coming to work or control freaks or, you know, if you work in, for a marketing agency and you're working as part of a team, you're waiting for someone else to finish their part of the job. So now you can go in and fill in the rest. Well, they're behind schedule. So guess what? Now you're behind schedule. Whereas working remotely, I don't have those problems. Well, and I break work into two, two segments, truly. I think there's the hard work, and that, that's what we're talking about, is of setting down and actually doing the work. Yeah. And then there's the soft work, and the soft work is the interaction that generates, hopefully, innovation and, uh, and uh, team spirit uh, and is all about the culture. Uh, but but I, I, think that, I think that you can do that remotely if you want to work at it instead of requiring everybody back into the office. What I find so interesting is that 
you, what you said about looking over your shoulder is absolutely true. Uh, and by the way, that's because people are try, these these people are trying to be managers. They want to manage the work yes. instead of right. And you know what we've seen yeah. is an increase in the spyware that employers now put on the work computer. So they can track the activities of the person who is not in the office and ensure that they're doing the work. Once, once again, we need to flip that mindset to outcome, to performance, not to time. As long as we continue to, to tie what we believe performance is to time, actual minutes spent working, we're not going to get what we need out of the workforce, which is innovation and creativity. You still get to, you still have to meet the expectations. But man, if I'm capable of getting up at four o'clock in the morning and doing the work, why do you require me to be sitting in front of the computer at nine? It makes no sense to me. But that's a mind, that's a that's a mind shift that we're going through right now, hopefully. Uh, and again, when I look at that level of, of flexibility that should be a part of the person's job. And by the way, there, there are people that they have to be there. I mean, I understand if you're a frontline worker doing uh, sales and a cashier. Uh, in uh, J.C. Penney's, well, I'm not sure they still exist, but in Kmart, uh, yeah, you got to be there. I'm sorry, I wish that you could work from home, but you can't. But for those that can, let them. You want engagement and satisfaction? Let them be in charge of this. As long as they still give you the outcome you want, and you also said it earlier, the problem is we now have to get very specific about outcomes. Instead of hours, we need to actually look at performance that generates results. That requires us as leaders or managers to actually have to work. Most don't want to. It's better yeah. to have them sitting there because I think I'm getting what I'm paying for. Yeah. Let me ask you, what is leadership self-care when we talk about management? Well, first, I don't believe that you can be a leader that takes care of others unless you take care of yourself. And that requires that you look at yourself as a performance athlete, that you need to do the things necessary so you can perform your job of leadership, which is the most difficult job there is because of the different components of it. And you need to be as, as, good as you can be, because especially during the pandemic, I believe that leaders, one of the leaders job was to go to their team and help them de-stress. And they did that by going there and interacting in an empathetic way and talking to people as human beings, finding out how they were doing, uh, asking that weird, crazy word we don't like, how are you feeling for a lot of leaders is a terrible thing to have to ask, even though I believe it's a part of it's a required part of the conversation today. And and so when they do that, if you're doing it correctly, when you leave that relationship, that that interaction, you're taking stress off of them, but you're putting it on yourself. You absorb it. If that's the case, you now have to have a, a well being regime that allows you to de-stress in a way that keeps you as up as a high performer when you interact with your team. What do I mean by that? Well, it's very simple. We all know this routine, by the way. We know the requirements. You need to get enough sleep. And I don't want to hear that you can get by on four hours. You're not in college anymore. You're, you're a leader of an organization that requires that you be a top performer of that organization. Get enough sleep. You need to eat appropriately. Uh, pandemic pounds pisses me off. Anyone who decided that because it was the pandemic, they had the, the authority to eat badly and drink more because that made them feel better, it should not be in a leadership position. I'm sorry, that's not what that did. The pandemic is, is that opportunity to get better at leading, not, not to not get better at leading. And the last thing is exercise. I just got off a coaching call with uh, with, a, with a person that a, co a uh, leader, a team leader. He's got geez, thirty million dollars, thirty million bucks under him, and and I've been talking to him about the need to exercise. 
And of course, the first thing I hear is I don't have time. And the reality is you, you don't have the time not to exercise. You need to do this. So those are the three legs of the well-being, well-being stool. The fourth one, though, is the one that I believe everybody says when they hear me say this, they say, well, well, it, you're, you're self-serving. You need to have someone as a leader that you can talk to who is not an employee, who is not vested in your company or your performance. That's where a coach or a mentor or an advisor is a part of the program. Because they can be objective. Absolutely. And you can, you know, and, by, and, and it's the truth, right? I need to, I need to have someone I can tell the truth to. If I'm upset, I'm not so sure that I want to show how upset I am to my team. I want to be authentic. I want to be vulnerable. They don't need to see me as a leader have a meltdown, right? I think that's a little bit too much exposure and it upsets people to the degree that they start to wonder if in fact the company's in trouble. But you need to be able to have that meltdown or to have that conversation with someone that you can trust that's outside the organization and is going to help you get over it. Uh, without that, those four things, tough to be a leader in a pandemic, tough to be a leader post pandemic. Yeah, I agree. Um, let me ask you, do you think that the whole term hustle culture works in opposition? to what you just described, the whole uh, mentality that if I only work harder, I can achieve this. Absolutely bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I see people who advocate that, I'm like, do you have any idea what you're telling people you want them to do? I mean, in, in, uh, in Japan, they actually have a term for dying at work. They have had people who've died at their desk. Uh, the Chinese have this bizarre, you know, I, I forget what it, it, it's, it's nine, nine and six, whatever it is. It's an extraordinary amount of work on a daily basis. And what you have now is opposition by people laying down. You can't force that. First, I don't understand what you think you're getting out of it. At some point, the number of hours that you work starts to decline productivity. At the max is 50 hours. Research shows that anything over 50 hours of work, you start to have a declining return on uh, investment. Uh, yeah. If you hit 70 hours, you actually are being less productive than you would be if you were working a normal day. So let's get over this, that, that it's the amount of time that we need to be working that matters. That's never it, especially in the information age. You can, you can spend, if you've, let me give you an example. I actually had a client that, that called me and said, I have a specific problem. And I was told that you would be a good person to run this situation by, and you would be able to give me a, a, at least some direction. I said, absolutely. Uh, he told me what it was. And I said, all right, let me think about this. Two days later, I called him back and I said, here is my recommendation. And he said, damn, that's spot on. I think that will work. And he said, so send me your bill. I did. He contacted me and said, you really think a lot of yourself, don't you? <laughs> I said, well, apparently, since you're calling me, I see what's about the bill. And he said, yeah. He said, don't you think that's a lot of uh, money to charge for a two days of, of thinking? I said, no, I'm not charging you for the two days of thinking. I don't work by the hour. I'm charging you for the solution. And I said, by the way, is it the right solution? Well, yeah. Is it going to solve the problem? Well, yeah. Uh, okay send me the check so so you see we've got we've got to get over this thing about uh, by the way he would have been really happy if i'd taken a week if i waited for two weeks and, mm -hmm. and then said you know i'm still thinking about this give me a couple of more days but I'm, I'm not you know again i turn myself to no bs uh performance coach i'm not engaging in that anymore i refuse to accept that and i refuse to accept the concept of a hustle culture that's ridiculous yeah i think it's I think it's a Protestant work ethic that appeals to many people who, you know, if we talk about archetypes, they resonate with the stern father figure, the whole, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five grind. And I, I was in it and I can, you know, attest that it's not about working harder. It's about working smarter and, 
what is it that you're doing? Is it giving you the outcomes that you want? What could you do to tweak this and tweak that so that you can reach more of the right type of people as opposed to people in general? I remember I used to go to networking events, which are a huge waste of time. You go there, you have to order some kind of cheap food that's overpriced and not very good. You sit there, you have to listen to other people tell you about their insurance scams or what have you. And then as far as from my perspective, they're not expecting you. They don't know anything about you. They don't really want to because they have their own agenda. You're trying to sell what you do. They're trying to sell you what they do. And never the twain shall meet. In a lot of ways, COVID has been very good because it's taught me how to be more surgical in what you do and why you do it. And also be more reflective. But let me switch gears a little bit and ask you about team building and team performance. How is leadership self care since we just talked about that important to higher team performance? And then how would you would carry that over into team building? Well, I'm a strong believer in the concept two concepts. We're not ready for the second one I'm going to talk about. But the first one is developing a high performance work team to me is the job of every leader. And that means first getting the right people on the team, uh, which means competency has got to be a part of the equation. If you're not competent to do the work, uh, why would you be on that team? Uh, and by the way, if you're not competent, the other team members quickly determine that and it destroys morale. Uh, and, and they need to pay, they'll start trying to, they, and by the way, they, teams are odd about once you're a part of the team, the other team members will try to make up for your deficits. And so they'll work harder. But the problem is that leads to, uh, that leads to other team members being dissatisfied and maybe burned out and ready to leave. If you leave someone who's incompetent on a team, first that reflects on you as a leader. Mm. You know, if you can't recognize incompetency, uh, what are you doing trying to tell me you're in charge? You're not. And once once it's become apparent, because I uh, there's a uh, my my granddaughters are all into Taylor Swift, and so accordingly, I know too many Taylor Swift lyrics. But one of them that I think is absolutely apropos is she says, "I'm a nightmare dressed like a daydream." And I find that a lot of people who get hired and put on teams have managed to work their way through the interviewing process and, and probably an inadequate onboarding process and get themselves into a team. Yes, yes, indeed. I once worked at a college and I don't want to be really specific, but the person who was higher up the food chain from me, extremely gregarious extremely likable. He would take me out for lunch three, four times a week on the company dime, of course. He didn't have the minimal requirements for the job, but he knew how to kind of um, smooch, I guess, for lack of a better word. He knew how to play up to people. He knew how to be so likable uh you know very good at things and kind of brush things under the carpet he was so good at that that he was able to get this position and i remember looking at his resume or something online once and i found out he never worked at the same place for more than one to two years at the most never well that's reflective of somebody finally having had enough so he would last yeah he would last about two years and then disappear well, or they let him go during that, during that period of time i guarantee you and by the way they, he falls within the category of what i call the working dead they're 20 percent of any organization's uh, employee group that workforce that absolutely needed to be fired yesterday but nobody either has the and nobody either has the guts or the willingness to terminate them uh, and so they stay, but what they are, they're to toxic. And on every team that one of these working dead exists, they start to destroy not only performance, but they also start to destroy commitment to the organization and the team. People leave because of the working dead. The working dead have no reason to leave. 
first, they, they like it where they're at. Uh, they're managing to collect their paycheck. Uh, they're enjoying themselves. You just described one. And, uh, and why would they chance having to go and go through their performance to get hired someplace else? They stay until you get rid of them. Good leadership susses them out. First, they, if you don't have a, a robust onboarding process, this is what happens. The wrong person gets hired and placed on a team. You want to eliminate them in the onboarding process so they don't impact the high performance work team. But once they're there, they need to be gotten rid of quickly. And I often have team leaders who, when they finally get rid of one of the working dead, the first thing is the team says to them, what took you so long? So what we have here is a double-edged sword. First, they've destroyed some performance, but they've also eroded the credibility of the team leader. So now I'm not so sure you know what you're doing. All of that impacts performance. And you can't have a high-performance work team unless they have psychological safety to begin with. We spoke about that earlier. Mm -hmm. That, is, that is, is shown through Google research that psychological safety is more important than who's on the team. Yeah. Because you need to be able to be honest with each other and with the team leader so that you can do the work in the best way possible. If you don't think that's what's happening, you have an obligation and a psychological safe team to say this, to, to express yourself and not worry about that knee jerk negative reaction. So to me, it's the team members that create the culture of psychological safety. And, and it, by the way, the concept of who's responsible for psychological safety is everybody, not just the team leader, team members. They need to protect other team members so that they feel safe in expressing their opinion. And if they don't see that happening, they need to speak out about it. And by the way, this is this requires courage. Because, but if you don't do that, if you don't have that level of psychological safety, no team is high performing. They're never, they never feel safe enough to be creative or innovative and do the necessity about changing the process. Interestingly enough, if you want to know if a process is working, where should you go? What to the person who's using the process? And it, let me, let me just throw out an 80 percenter here. 80% of the time, the team members will tell you the process sucks and they're getting work done by workarounds. So they are actually being forced to figure out how to do their job so that the current process doesn't stop them. And yet the team leader thinks the process is fantastic because nobody said we have to do this in this convoluted workaround. But that's the way it is. High performance teams immediately go, the process doesn't work. It needs to be changed. Here's how it needs to be changed. You know how I know that? I'm the one that does the work. So listen to me. Don't listen to anybody else. Listen to me. And you're going to get the outcome. In fact, you're going to get better than you thought you were going to get with outcome. That to me is a high performing work team. But let me go one step further. The concept of a self-directed work team. See, with a high performance work team, you still have a team leader. I, I consider the team leader to be a player coach. And that's good because they, they're there to, to be a part of the team and they're there to coach the team. When you get to a self-directed work team, you've taken the team leader concept out and you've replaced them with a coach, a facilitator and a mediator, maybe three people. What would be an example of that? Because I'm trying to think from my own experience. I remember working somewhere where there was a project manager and he just said, hey, look, based on your experience, your credentials, I'm just going to trust that you know how to handle this. I want you to do a great job. If the client complains, handle it is how you think best, because I know you've already done this a million times. I felt 10 feet tall, but I know not everybody in that particular team felt the same way. What's an example of, of what you just described in action? Well, it, I, I believe that, that Zappos had a, attempted to do this. Uh, they, they did not do it well, but you're absolutely correct about this. Some people are not comfortable with that. Now I look at them and go, you are looking to be managed to meet expectations. The whole concept of a self-directed work team is exceed expectations. 
And that requires a commitment by everybody on the team to do exactly that. Most people find that not to be to their own uh, self-interest. Uh, so when you talk about this working, I saw Zappos has that opportunity. They actually came up with a uh, term for it, uh, heligarchy. And it was basically that, it, that, that the teams made the decisions. And by the way, uh, obviously, may, may, that self-directed doesn't mean you get to do what you want. It means you get to do what is necessary the way that is most effective for the team so that you still get the outcome. And with a self-directed team, at some point, you exceed expectations. So Zappos would be the one example that I use that, uh, but we're not ready for that. I, I can tell you that, that just trying to turn managers into leaders is where most American companies are. Uh, do I think the future though is self-directed? Absolutely. Hmm. What trans, well, I think you've already answered that question. Let me ask you, what gaps do you see in how managers hire and outsource and how can it be done more effectively in order to attain the outcomes that they say they want? Well, at first, if you're going to hire, you should be you should be including the team that they're being hired to be on. To me, that is, and, and I look at I look at two that any interview is bifurcated into two portions. The first interview is all about qualifications and experience so that I can determine your level of competency. The second one is a interview about cultural fit. And that to me, if, if you don't pass both those interviews, you should not be hired. And some people have argued with me that cultural fit, when we talk about this, we're being homogenous. I disagree with that. I don't believe that this is an attempt to, to, uh, to maintain lack of diversity, just the opposite. I believe that if the culture is strong, you're inviting diversity. But I also know that those two elements have got to align before you can put a person on a team and expect the team to accept them if they're a high performance work team. And that's where I always go. If you don't want a high performance work team, keep just making these stupid decisions and hire the wrong person. They get chewed up after six months or three months. You know, <laughs> onboarding is done so poorly at most companies that within 45 days, no, within 90 days, 40% of all new hires have quit. Well, one of two things, either they weren't able, they didn't understand what the job was and, and they weren't able to do it, or the team spit them out. So yeah. how about if we, start, we avoid this, this expense of time and energy and do it a different way? In, involve the team. So that, by the way, the teams need oversight. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about a democracy here. I understand it's not, but I also know that if you trust your team, and here we're back to the T word. If I trust my team, they're going to make the decision not because of self-interest, but because of organizational interest. And there's no one who wants their team to fail. Do you think that corporate team building, as we usually think of it is effective and helpful anymore. I mean, where you have the employees going and uh, what's the most popular one where you go on a ship and they tie different knots and they work with the sails in order for the boat to drift along the ocean. Are, are these experiments, I guess, or, or team, these team building exercises, because that's what they are, are they effective? Absolutely not. That is so bullshit. And once again, I apologize if people are offended by my language, but it's irritating to hear that we're still believing that those type of exercise mean anything. They don't. They're, 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 it just doesn't. What you're more interested in, I would think, is let's put the person into a situation they're going to face as a member of the team. And let's see how they do in that situation, because that starts to give me the information I need uh, rather than rather than do this weird, you know, let's all let's all do safety falls or let's get on the rope ladders. I, that's just ridiculous. I don't believe in any of that. Uh, and therefore, I'm not the guy to talk to. I have those, by the way, those people who believe it means something need to show me some some statistical evidence that it matters. 
because I never see any results that are connected to the team exercise. We just do it, spend the money, and move on, hoping that it's had some positive impact. It hasn't. Yeah, usually my own experience is I've done plenty of those team building exercises, usually on a ship. Um, and I'll tell you, usually they're fun. They're fun. Yeah. They're fun to do because you get to go out on a ship, you're out on the water. And then as soon as the ship docks, everybody takes off in their own different cars. You never hear anything from them again. You go to work and everybody's goofing off and uh, yeah. playing games on the computers, taking three hour lunch breaks. Nothing's changed at all. Let me ask you, do you see any trends in corporate team building? Is there a type of school of exercise or process that you know of uh, that has been effective or perhaps you favor? Well, I, I do favor on the job training that is conducted by the team. You see, once again, I believe that if you want to be a member of a team, the team needs to take you in. They need to take you in and, and train you to be able to do the job as a part of the team. So maybe and like I, like a limited apprenticeship? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I, it, it, again, as a part of the onboarding process, the team leader uh, should be a part of that process so that they can first, I believe that employ, that people who are looking for a job often apply for a job and they have no idea what that job really is about because the job description is not about the job. Yeah. And, and, and if they're looking with a recruiter, well, the recruiter's job is to recruit people. So you know what they do? They make the job sound like it's a lot better than it really is. It's a lot different than it really is. And the person walks into that job and says, oh, my God, this is not what I thought it was. Let's, let's have some realism on both sides. Let's not try to trick people into coming to work for the company. And the way we do that is we bring the team leader out and we do the introduction. And we have that person that's doing the work or overseeing the work explain the work. And we work our way through the onboarding process. And yes, we're now going to take you, we're going to place you in the situation that you really have to work with. And by the way, I, I believe in the buddy system. Once the team leader has made sure that he, that he or she is comfortable with the person, you then assign a buddy from the team to this new hire. Mm, I That's like that cool. idea. I oh, like sure. that. And now you're yeah. now you're talking, Paul. That's actually very similar to Aikido, where you have the main instructor. But I remember when I was taking Aikido and, and you're getting beat up and thrown all around and they're twisting you all every which way. But I remember you had the main instructor, but then there would be two or three guys in the back and on the side watching and telling you, this is how you fall down so you don't hurt yourself. This is how you should throw someone so they don't want to kill you when they get up. Um, you know, this is how you do the movement so you don't break your, your wrist or your elbow and everything. And they're working with you. Meanwhile, the main instructor can look at the other assistants and say, okay, are you teaching them correctly rather than run all around putting out fires like a, like a, like a fool? Well, and that buddy system allows the new hire to be inculcated into the team, but also into the culture. Because now you have somebody whose job is to make sure you're successful. And they're going to be working with you as a team member. They have a vested interest in your success. But they also know that if you're not going to work out, they don't want you to stay because you're making their job and the team's job harder. So you've got somebody who's got a vested interest in your success, but is more than willing to accept the fact that if you're not the fit, either you're not competent or you're not culturally a fit, they're willing to spit you out quickly. They're not going to waste time. They don't have time to waste. And But that buddy suddenly makes your transition onto the team and into the culture much more acceptable. And it happens faster. So the buddy system absolutely works. That's got to be a part of this hiring process. And let me I, I, let me tell you the one exercise that that I believe when it comes to training works is improv. Now, improvisation to me is a interesting the, theatrical experience that I believe every leader should have to go through. And by the way. My wife and I did this as a team. 
because I wanted to experience it. I, I watched this and I was like, this seems to me to be a, an excellent training uh, opportunity. And it is. And she was so much better than I was at it because the whole concept of improv is you give instead of take. Yes. And that to me is something that is exceptionally uh, an exceptional skill set that we have to first be aware it matters. Then we have to practice it. And improv forces you to practice giving. Uh, that's the one thing that I recommend to everyone in my coaching program is that they've, and by the way, it's been difficult, obviously, with the pandemic, but there's all these little improv theaters around. You can find one. You can mm. even do it online, but in person is absolutely better. And I believe that that is, that, that is a huge opportunity for a team leader to actually get better. I think it's, it's great input. And yet also, I think improvising also challenges the people involved to think on their feet, to be more creative, to be more innovative. And you kind of look at problems like a Rubik's Cube as opposed to passing the buck or, uh, you know, I'm just going to delete this email and say I never saw it, you know. Well, I, Paul, I had a great time talking with you. For people who want to learn more about your services and also we didn't even talk about your book, so I'd love to have you back if you're uh, receptive to that. Oh, absolutely. How can people learn more about your services and get in touch with you? Well, I, paulglovercoaching.com will take you to my website where you get to see uh, what I do and, and how I do it. Uh, obviously, my LinkedIn profile also uh, on LinkedIn, Paul Glover Coaching. Uh, that's the way to get in touch with me, and uh, and I would love to come back and talk about my book. I. <laughs> I wrote the book, uh, geez, I guess it's been 10 years ago, and I didn't like it. Uh, as my wife said, uh, it was probably the most expensive ego piece that I've ever done. But interestingly enough, David, I'm going to pat myself on the back. It is actually a precursor to the way things are now that they weren't 10 years ago. It, 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 I went back and I reread my book and I was like, oh, my God, I actually I actually was doing some predictions about how things should be, but weren't. Uh, so, yes, I'd love to talk about the book. That sounds great. Thanks again for your time, Paul. I'm going to uh, get back in touch with you and have you back on for part two. And uh, thanks for anybody watching and listening to this as well. If you've enjoyed our discussion with Paul, don't forget to like this and subscribe. Every little bit helps us along our journey. And take care, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.